is June 30th, 2020. Welcome to the continuation of our series of events, Tuesdays with the Mackinac Center. And uh, we're delighted to bring you another great policy event that I hope will uh, keep you intrigued and informed about the work we're doing at the Mackinac Center. Um, this event is called Seven Principles of Sound Environmental Policy, How Markets Can Help Protect Our Natural Environment. And we've got uh, two great guests with us. And of course, as always, joined by our president, Joe Lehman. Um, Joe, if you don't already know, is uh, president of the Mackinac Center and has been so since 2008, an engineer by training. Um, during his tenure, the Ma Michigan has seen numerous free part market policy advances in the areas of education, labor, and state fiscal affairs, frequently published in national and state media. Joe has also trained more than 600 public policy executives internationally on strategic leadership and communications, and he and his wife are founders of the Midland County Habitat for Humanity. And we'll start off with uh, remarks from you, Joe. Thank you very much, Don, and welcome, and thank you to all the Mackinac Center supporters who have tuned in today to hear Jason and Todd talk about environmental policy. But it is, it's especially good to be able to uh, speak right before them to wish all of you a tremendous Independence Day holiday. It's uh, almost hard to think of this being a time to celebrate uh, with all of the tumult uh, that surrounds us, but I am reminded that as bad as things may seem to be right now, the country has been through worse, and I'm confident that we will come through these things again, and we'll come through these things stronger. After all, we were the country uh, that was born as a, a tiny upstart wannabe republic taking on the world's lone superpower, and we prevailed. And I'm reminded of uh, the words of our late senior vice president, Joe Overton, who, uh, who uh, incidentally passed away tragically 17 years ago this very day. Uh, he wrote a memo to the staff once on uh, the Mackinac Center staff on, on how we should uh, observe Independence Day. He wrote, all staff are encouraged to celebrate Independence Day with passion and verve, remembering it as the signatory day of a document embodying the most sublime of political ideals, an apogee in mankind's quest for liberty of thought and action, the restoration of which is the vision of our organization. And I still get chills every time I remind myself of those words uh, that Joe penned. And it gives us strength to actually carry through in, in tough times. And we've been uh, working uh, uh, very diligently in this strange environment. Uh, I have a, a big update for you today uh, from the United States Supreme Court. If you haven't heard the good news yet, <clears throat> the court has ruled in the case, uh, has released its ruling in the case of Espinoza uh, versus Montana Department of Revenue, and it involved the school choice program. And we're still digesting all of the opinion. It was a five to four decision. And essentially, the Supreme Court has found today uh, that uh, states, even the state's constitutional provisions, cannot restrict school choice programs from benefiting uh, religious schools. The majority of private schools in this country are religious schools. So this is very big. There were 37 states that had very severe restrictions in their constitutions on how school choice programs uh, could be used at private religious schools. And by our quick reading so far, it looks like uh, things may improve drastically in 32 of those states. Uh, Michigan, however, is, is in the group that uh, it isn't clear yet on how exactly Michigan will directly uh, benefit uh, the parents and kids who just want the safest and best schools, uh, whether they be private or public or, or whatever. 
Uh, but we will continue uh, working to make sure that, that the victory that now blankets most of the country applies to Michigan as much as it can. And I have some more good news about uh, the Mackinac Center's efforts to um, uh, wisely reopen Michigan society. As you know, we've seen that uh, severe lockdowns uh, can slow the spread of the virus, and it is a dangerous virus, but there's a downside too. Uh, economists uh, look at trade-offs. Uh, almost never do economists get to look at absolute solutions to a problem. So there have been costs associated with the trade-offs too. And in one of our lawsuits, which we had to bring against Governor Whitmer, was uh, one of her ex against one of her executive orders, which essentially prevented all kinds of medical care from occurring in this state in order to um, lock down as much of the state as possible, keeping uh, sufficient beds and things open for COVID patients. Well, those beds never filled up, and the lockdowns uh, on other kinds of a little bit less urgent care uh, became, well, they had created some urgent situations for some people. One of, uh, uh, one of our clients even developed gangrene because he was unable to get the care that he needed. Uh, thankfully, shortly after we filed our suit, the governor withdrew her executive order. However, uh, we are continuing our case, and the Michigan Supreme Court has agreed to take up uh, our case and consider it. And so uh, that's a, an exciting development, uh, which can mean that we, we may discover uh, that there are some limits uh, that, that aren't clear yet in how much power a, a governor has to actually lock down society. <clears throat> our work also continues to help government employees around the country who are members of unions, uh, oftentimes without even realizing they ever had a choice uh, we're helping them take advantage of the Janus decision at the U.S. Supreme Court two years ago, which now uh, gives them more freedom than ever to opt out of a union they may not want to belong with. And the states where we're educating the most people are having the largest changes in government union membership. Uh, even after one year, membership uh, among big public sector unions in California was down 28%. It was down 20% in Pennsylvania, 32% in Maryland, 16% in New Jersey. Attorneys general in Texas, Alaska, and Indiana have, have said in, in their official capacity that employees uh, who work for government in those states uh, need to give affirmative consent to being in a union. Otherwise, they're considered uh, not part of a union. So these, these are big Big victories for workers who simply want a choice and don't want to be coerced or nudged into one choice or another. So that's a quick update on uh, what uh, has been happening at the Mackinac Center. And I'm just so grateful that we have your support uh, and your attendance uh, here today. And I know that uh, you will really benefit from Jason's and Todd's remarks. So with that, I thank you again and turn it back to Don. Thank you so much for that great update, Joe. A lot of good news to share, and um, it's refreshing to hear um, at this point of the year in 2020 after what we've been through. So thank you so much for those great updates. So let's turn to our program, our agenda, uh, Seven Principles of Sound Environmental Policy. And uh, before I get into the, the questions that I have for our speakers, I want to introduce them. Um, Jason Hayes, aforementioned Director of Environmental Policy for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, has spent almost three decades studying and working in environmental and energy policy. He worked as a backcountry ranger in British Columbia uh, in their provincial parks, as a forester in British Columbia's boreal forest, and researched national parks management and grizzly bear biology with the Fraser Institute in Calgary, Alberta. He spent over a decade researching and communicating energy and environmental policy with the Canadian and American energy industries. And then uh, Todd Myers, a beekeeper by trade and the director of the Center for the Environment at the Washington Policy Center. He's one of the nation's leading experts on free market environmental policy. He formerly served on the executive team at the Washington State Department of Natural Resources is currently a member of the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council. 
and also a, a great baseball fan like myself. I know I'm sure we're all excited that baseball is going to be returning soon. But into the, let's get to the heart of the matter and why our attendees have joined us. So I'm going to start this question um, with you, Todd. Um, what is the most interesting example of an innovative technology that you have encountered that helps drive environmental management and efficiency ahead of regulators? So thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as you mentioned, I've worked um, in environmental policy for about 20 years and worked at a state agency. So I've seen the things that state agencies can do and the reason that, um, that they're important. But there are a lot of limits to what they can do and often the incentives of state agencies don't align with the environment. Politicians, primarily what they're interested in is what looks good, what gets them elected. They, they certainly care about the environment. I don't, uh, I don't think that they're completely cynical, but it's hard for people who aren't scientists or aren't economists to make good decisions about what the best policy is. What they do know is what makes them look good. And so the reason that we have to focus on technologies and personal approaches is, is that you need to align the incentives of the individual with the environment and technology really allows you to do that. And I'll just give you a, an amazing example. So right now people are concerned about plastic in the ocean. For cities um, and states, Washington State, we just passed a ban on plastic grocery bags. CERN um, uh, is supposed to be about ocean plastic. Of course, plastic bags, especially from the United States, don't end up in the ocean very much. Lanka, a little nation off of the tip of India, puts four times as much plastic into the ocean as the entire United States combined. So how do you deal with that when there's no governmental structure in places like the Philippines, Indonesia, Sri Lanka? The way you do it is you give incentives. So there's a company called Plastic Bank, and what Plastic Bank does is that it pays people to go collect plastic trash, might wash out into the ocean, return it to them, and they do the whole thing based on smartphones. They pay people, people can have a, a cryptocurrency actually that they can use to buy things. Um, and then what they do is they take the plastic that is collected, they recycle it, they sell it to SC Johnson. You go to your store and see a Windex bottle, it will have a sticker on it that said, made from ocean plastic, plastic that would have gone into the ocean. So the regulations, are about doing something flashy, like banning plastic bags, even though that doesn't actually do much to help the environment. Using technology and using personal incentives in a way that we never could before because we now have smartphones are so powerful, we can attack an issue where governmental structures are not very strong and you need something else. So I think it's a perfect example of where technology and market forces are doing better than government. Great example, Todd. I, I'm going to look for those stickers from here on out. Thank you for that uh, that information. Uh, before I turn to you, Jason, on that same question, just want to remind our audience that if you look in the right-hand corner of your screen, if you have any questions for our presenters, please post them there in the Q&A section, and we will try to get through them, as many of them as possible, before the end of our event. So, Jason, turning back to you on the question of innovative technology driving environmental management. Yeah, um, my favorite technology is one that actually Todd uh, showed me. So um, I'll, I'll explain that in one second. But to build on something, the, the point that uh, Todd was just making, there was actually a, um, a, a blog post published yesterday in New Atlas that described a company in Japan, uh, NEC is the name of the com company, and they've developed a plastic called a knee cycle that is actually 50% cellulose from non-edible plants, so wood fiber and that sort of thing. And I just read about this yesterday, and they're saying that uh, early tests are showing that it has just as good um, a performance as far as um, you know ability to wrap foods and stop disease and that sort of thing. But when left outside, if it falls into the ocean or something like that, uh, if it goes into a landfill, left outside, it'll break down, biodegrade in about four years. 
So this is a private company that's doing this without, uh, you know, any regulation telling them that they have to do it. There's just another way to build on what uh, Todd is saying. Um, there's there's different options that are coming out. But uh, the, my favorite technology that uh, has been developed by the private private industry is something called Sense. And uh, it actually is a little sensor that sits in your breaker box. And it literally watches and it just kind of sits there and tells you, and again, building on what Todd said about the ability of smartphones to help us be more, uh, I guess, environmentally conscious uh, and to be more efficient in our lives. Sense will tell you um, second by second, well, somebody just turned on a light bulb in your house. Somebody just turned on the clothes dryer. Uh, somebody just turned on the TV, anything like that. And it'll tell you literally moment by moment how much electricity is going through your breaker box. And so it allows you to kind of watch what's going on. And if you see something turned on and operating in your house and you know because of time of day rates or something like that or because you're out at the office and you don't, uh, want your TV left on all day, uh, you know when something is running in your house. And then you can match that technology with another technology, something called the Internet of Things or a smart home kind of app. And you can actually, in many cases, just by sitting at your desk at the office, you could shut the lights off in your house. Or you could set them on a timer so they turn on and off at a certain time. You can shut off the dryer. You can do all sorts of things with your smartphone. And again, all of these are technologies that are available to us, not because some government agency said that this has to be done. It wasn't some mandate from on high that came down and said, this is, this is what we're classifying as efficient and everybody in society must meet this level of efficiency. Companies are doing it because it actually is good business and they can sell their product and people can, like you and I, are interested in cutting our costs. We don't want to spend as much each month on our electricity bill. So we can choose to em employ these technologies and not need a government mandate to do it. Great. So the, the theme in both of, both of your answers is proper incentives. Um, which often government does not have. Uh, Jason, let's start with you on a uh, second question. Um, in the, the recently published paper that's the, 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 the crux of this, of, of this presentation, Seven Principles of Sound Environmental Policy, the first principle discusses that we should start with individuals. Um, but how do you deal with the reality that not all people are experts in environmental management? Why should we trust individuals instead of government experts? Right, building on the ideas that I just talked about, you don't need to be an expert in utility or utility regulation to understand that you want to spend 150 a month on your electricity bill instead of 300 a month. That's, I mean, again, you don't need a PhD in economics to understand that. You don't need a PhD in ecology or biology or, or whatever. To understand that that's something that's going to be obvious to pretty much everybody but individuals are the ones that actually live on the ground in the areas that are being impacted by a lot of the policies that we're putting out or that government is uh, imposing or mandating those those policies hit everybody as they're you know they look out their front window that's what's happening these people are breathing the air in in their yard they're drinking the water that's coming out of their taps. So there's one example, another example of uh, a technology that was developed by a mix of individuals, uh, organizations, in this case, the Nature Conservancy, uh, and it worked for uh, small businesses, farmers in California, and the, the program is called Bird Returns. And it, it watches when, uh, actually, again, using smartphones, uh, TNC developed a smartphone app and it allows people to come and, and watch when they're, they're, they're looking for birds that are migrating south uh, through California. And when they see a certain bird, they punch it into their phone and they say, this bird on this day in this location. 
And that tells the wildlife biologists that are looking at the reports from this uh, smartphone app that these birds are beginning to migrate. And so what TNC did is they took that knowledge and they went to rice farmers in California and they said essentially to the rice farmers, look, we'll pay you to do something that would normally be too expensive for you to do, which is plow up the, the rice straw. When, after you've harvested your rice, you can plow up the rice straw and essentially compost that rice straw in your fields and then flood the fields uh, just to you know a depth of a couple inches. But what it does is it allows those birds that are flying south to have habitat. So when they come and they set down, they have a place to stay. They have a, a place where they can forage for food and they can do all of these sorts of things. And so what they found is that TNC was happy because their supporters said, this is the kind of thing we want you to do. So we'll give you money to do this. The farmers were happy because TNC was paying them the costs that were associated with doing this extra work in their fields. So the farmers were still making money living their lives. And then the birds are happy because they are um, they have habitat now. And then as a side spin-off benefit, the farmers and, and TNC actually figured out that doing this to their fields actually was kind of like fertilizing them and made them much more productive. So there was another benefit that came out of it. And again, all of this happened because individuals wanted to do it, not because some um, you know, government agency said, you need to do this to protect birds or to make your fields uh, more fertile or that sort of thing. So again, it's an individual choice. Thanks, Jason. Before I turn to you, Todd, on that question, I just want to uh, let, remind the audience that if you want to follow along with the seven principles of sound environmental policy, I posted an answer to a question that was in the uh, Q&A as to where to find uh, the, the, the published study. And um, you can just easily find it if you go to mackinaw.org backslash events. Um, for the description of this event, it's the uh, publication is embedded in the description of the event seven principles of sound environmental policy. So I urge you to go there and, and follow along as our presenters uh, speak throughout uh, the event. Uh, so Todd, turning back to you on the question of starting with individuals as the first principle, what are your thoughts on that? So the question is why individuals are not experts. Uh, but what you have to remember is that the experts aren't experts. Ask the people in Flint, Michigan, if the experts are experts, right? It wasn't individuals who caused that problem. It was people at Michigan DEQ and the EPA who uh, couldn't decide, you know, what how to act. Um, but the other thing is, is that so I am an expert um, in energy and environmental policy. But when I got the sense monitor that uh, Jason just talked about, I was surprised at how much electricity light bulbs were using. Um, so the reason I was able to find that out is because I had local knowledge and I had an, a personal incentive to save that electricity. I can't go, I couldn't tell other people in my neighborhood or in another state, here's what you should do in your house. I can give some general guidelines, but they are the experts in what they do. And so local knowledge is the best knowledge, the most important knowledge. So I think the key thing about this is saying, well, wait a minute, individuals aren't experts. We should listen to the experts. We overestimate what experts know and underestimate the information that people have on their own to make good environmental decisions. Great. Thank you so much for that, Todd. Todd, I'm going to stick, stick with you on this uh, next question. We see many companies and representatives of private industry um, that were, to put it simply, uh, bad actors. Um, our history is obviously replete with uh, folks in private industry and landowners that have damaged the natural environment for their own personal uh, profit. So why should we trust them to manage the environment better than government? So the key thing, I get this question all the time as if it's an either or. So in 1970, when we passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and 1970s when we created the EPA, the problems that we had were big smokestacks and big outfalls into water, precisely because what you're talking about, which is that polluting was free, essentially. Um, and so those laws changed that. Our air and water are much cleaner. 
gay as a result of that. That worked. The argument is not that where there is a clear, where there, where there is an easy regulatory solution that is better than creating a market that we shouldn't take it. And in the case of big smokestacks, you should do it. Problem is, is that pollution that we face today is very different than in 1970. So Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the first director of the EPA, actually wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about 10 years ago saying that the solutions that we used in the 1970s won't solve the problems that we're facing today. There is no regulation that we can pass that will solve the plastic pollution problem that I discussed earlier because it is an international problem. Some of the governments are weak. In those sorts of circumstances, you have to use a different approach. That, I think, is the contrast. It is not that we replace places where regulation is working with market solutions. It is that you address the problems that we have where there are failures with market solutions, and there are a lot of them. The, the water pollution we say, see today is much more distributed, the air pollution. Um, the Endangered Species Act is something where you need private landowners to work. You can't just impose regulation. We see that. The vast majority of, of endangered species are not recovering. We have stopped them from going extinct in many cases, but they're not recovering. To get them to recovery, we need those private alternatives. So that's how that works together hand in hand. Frankly, the other issue is, is that um, private solutions are often more economically beneficial. They respect people's personal freedom and property rights, and those are good things too. So. Um, that's the kind of, that, those are the circumstances where I think that you use market approaches rather than just wholesale getting rid of all regulations, which is the accusation that is made, but it is nonsense. Thanks for that, Todd. Uh, Jason, to you on the question of um, the history of private industry or individuals as bad actors um, in terms of taking care of the environment, and why we should trust them over uh, government actors. Right, and uh, Todd already gave one good example of an idea why government may not always be the correct answer in the, the case of uh, Flint, the water supply in Flint, because it was government, literally a failure of government at the municipal, the city level, the state level, and the federal level that allowed the Flint water crisis to happen. Um, I'm looking at another situation, literally just finished writing a paper on um, management of national forests in the state of Arizona. And Arizona's fire uh, season is already starting. They already have somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, close to 290,000 acres in Arizona already burned. And that's before you hit July 1st. A lot of those fires are starting in national forests. So those forests are governed by and managed by the Federal Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service. So that's not said to beat up on the Forest Service. I've written about some of the, the difficulties that they find when they're trying to manage nation, national forests, kind of a back and forth between a preservationist mindset and a conservationist mindset, this, this idea of nature first or people first. And they literally get stuck in something that's called the process predicament, which doesn't allow them to manage in some cases. So, but it's those forests that are actually uh, causing a lot of the problems. And I've sat in meetings with um, the, uh, at the Department of Interior, with the Secretary of Interior speaking and, and plainly saying that the federal government, a lot of cases, has not been a good neighbor to states and to private landowners, and that something needed to change. And so an example of some of the changes that are being brought in, I'm, uh, again, the paper that I'm writing looks at an, a, a collaborative effort. It's called the Four Forest Restoration Initiative, where they're taking and putting four of those national forests together and inviting in a big group of people, like whether it's business, whether it's uh, communities, the state, uh, the federal government, obviously, because they're national forests, uh, native bands, uh, just a whole big group of some 40 different um, organizations, cities and, and, you know, governmental entities, private business, all that. And what they're doing is trying to find ways to solve this problem, to restore the forest, 
to go in and clean them up basically so they're not catching on fire the way that they have been over the past several decades. And one of the key ways that we're finding to uh, address this problem because of budgeting and funding issues, the federal government can't actually afford to fix the problem the way that it, it should be fixed. So they're now actually reaching out to private industry funding organizations like uh, pension funds and that sort of thing to try try to find ways to bring in private money to begin funding some of these restoration efforts. So if we only looked at just fixing these environmental challenges with government, our forests would still be catching on fire. So we actually need to bring in private uh, interests. And in this case, they're doing things called public-private partnerships to try to fund some of this restoration activity and actually decrease the fire uh, hazards. And in doing that, protect private property, increase water uh, quality, you know, protect wildlife and all the benefits that go along with having healthy forests. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, skipping ahead to the fifth principle in your and the seven principles uh, paper, um, it suggests that wealthy countries can better manage the environment than developing nations. Uh, but the media consistently distorts this and says that developed countries like the United States damage the environment. Um, why shouldn't we listen to elected officials like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez when she suggests that we need to pass legislation that forces us to move to a green economy that is based on a collective will to protect the environment? Right. So we can find the will, certainly, to protect the environment. We see it actually in private markets because people are demanding greener, more efficient products. If people didn't want those products, you would not have an organic uh, agriculture, for example. If people didn't care, they wouldn't be asking for more efficiency-related products like the Sense uh, app that uh, both Todd and I already talked about. That kind of um, organic demand is very well met by private or free markets. And in the sense of countries managing their uh, natural environment properly, one of the best ways to ensure that you have a clean and healthy environment is to be extremely rich. Because one of the things that you'll find, there's, there's an idea called the environmental Kuznets curve uh, that actually shows that as societies become more and more wealthy, once they reach what's called a turning point, once they around four to six thousand dollars per capita GDP, once people start earning that amount, then actually what happens is the more rich you get, the more you can afford to look out into the future and say, I'm willing to invest in buying a hybrid instead of a regular, like an, a traditional car. I can get rid of that old 1972 Ford pickup that I've been driving for the past however many years, and I can go find something that's far more efficient. I can afford to buy the Sense app or something like that, and I can use it to change or reduce the electricity that I'm using. A lot of those things only are become possible when you are very well off. And the reality is that if you're, you know, living in a developing nation and you're literally living hand to mouth, you're not going to worry about if if I cut down this tree to provide firewood so that I can cook food for my kids so they don't die, or I can heat my home so my kids don't freeze, you're going to worry if cutting down that tree is going to impact the climate in a 100 years if your kids are freezing tonight. When you're wealthy, you have the freedom and the ability to make those long-term choices that really are not possible for people who are living in a developing situation or living hand to mouth. And to build on yeah. that real quickly, um, people think that deforestation is caused by building houses or things like that. Deforestation occurs in the poorest countries in the world. Africa is where you actually see most deforestation because most wood is harvested to heat your home and cook your food. In North America, Northern Hemisphere, forest land is expanding. 
So in the richest portions of the world, we actually are increasing the amount of forest land. And it is in the poorest countries that you see deforestation. So it, this isn't just sort of a theory. It is, you can actually see it on the ground that poverty is directly related to environmental degradation. Thank you, Todd. Uh, thanks for your comments on that. And Todd, I, I, I'm going to stick with you here um, as we advance to the, the seventh principle. Um, you, uh, the, the paper argues that a lot of our policies are stuck in the 1970s and that we should be updated to encourage innovation and response to a lot of the, the um, environmental challenges that are out there. Um, but from the green perspective, the uh, environmental perspective that you often hear shared in the media, um, they believe that the regulation and ability of marginalized groups to have a seat at the planning table has been a key reason um, why we've been able to clean up the environment. So why would those folks want to give up the ability to pass laws and regulations that allow them to stop or litigate against companies that we believe are, that they believe are damaging the environment? Well, I'll just pick up on the, the Flint example uh, one more time. Um, toward After it was realized what was going on in Flint, EPA um, regional office in Chicago said, hey, we have a, this pot of money that we might be able to use to buy water filters for the people in Flint. They debated it, and, and the argument was, well, but if we do that, we would have to do it for other communities. One of the emails within EPA said, yeah, this would set a bad precedent. I'm not sure Flint is the kind of community we want to go out on a limb for. So if you think that having government in charge is going to represent marginalized communities, just remember that quote, which is just uh, astonishing. Um, what we need to do is rather than empowering bureaucracies and politicians and hope that they will represent the interests or communities or whoever, what we need to do is empower those people to take care of themselves. They are going to be the ones who do it, who know what is in their best interest and take care of themselves. That's what happened ultimately in Flint. And now we have more technologies that allow people to do this. We don't have to outsource our environmental concern to government. We can take it on ourselves. That's not just for the wealthy. That is also for people who are trying to get by day to day. In fact, we see some of the best environmental innovations in developing countries because they don't have the regulatory structure and they don't have a mindset of trust the government. We have a great example. In the capital of Ghana, they constantly have power outages. It's very difficult to know what is causing the power outage. So a team from Cal Berkeley went over and created an app on people's smartphones. When, and the, when the smartphone recognizes that the power that is lost, if it's charging and suddenly stops charging and the Wi-Fi goes out, it sends a ping to the uh, power company to say, we might have just lost power. Power company can then look and see, oh, there's a bunch of pings in this area. There's a power outage there. In the United States, we had to spend billions and billions of dollars to put smart meters to do this same thing. And in some places in the United States, you still have to call, like actually call your power company because you don't have a smart meter. In Ghana, all they did was create a free smartphone app that, that the power utility could look at. They did essentially for free what we've spent billions of dollars doing. That's the kind of innovation that goes on. And again, that only happens if you have a mindset of empowering people and giving them the ability to take care of themselves rather than outsourcing it to government and hoping that they do what's best for you, which we've seen time and again doesn't work out. That's a great example. Thanks for sharing that, Todd. Jason, that question to you on technological innovation and our environmental policies being stuck in the 1970s, what are, what are your thoughts on that? What type of updated thinking need we have going forward? Yeah, one of the, the reasons that uh, that we wrote that environmental regulation or environmental policy a lot of the time is stuck in the 70s is because for decades what we've done is something that uh, a fellow named Terry Anderson who worked at um, PERC, it's based out of Bozeman, Montana, but Terry was the one of the authors of the book Free Market Environmentalism. In 
another article that he wrote in 2014, he was talking about um, political environmentalism, and he was explaining that um, political environmentalism is this, this, I'll paraphrase what Terry said, this, this idea that if I disagree with you, uh, I want to go hunting, for example, and you want uh, the area to not have hunting then we disagree and we necessarily butt heads and we try to employ political means to answer the, the question of who gets to do what they want. And that, that starts that whole, there ought to be a law kind of mentality. So somebody will either call an elected legislator, uh, send an email to a regulator, or start calling a lawyer. And there's always that necessarily just kind of combative sort of attitude or that process that goes on. And a lot of the time what happens is nothing happens. And it's that exact kind of history that stuck again in environmental policy from the 1970s that caused the, the issues that I already discussed about the the national forest management in uh, in Arizona, in Michigan, in California, where literally nothing could happen because regulators and that were just frozen up. You couldn't approve any sort of activity in a national forest because if you did, somebody would litigate, and well, that had to be stopped. Okay, so if if that didn't happen, then some uh, legislator somewhere would pass a law that said whatever's going on has to stop. And instead, what we're finding now is in more, um, where again, like Todd said, where we're empowering individuals, where collaborative processes are coming in. Actually, you get a bunch of people sitting around a table and they all talk about, okay, well, what am I interested in? What do I want to happen on this landscape? And in Arizona specifically, what they all figured out is they don't want their forests to burn because that damages a whole lot of different things, private property, wildlife, water values, uh, the forests, obviously, all of those things are bad. So as they were sitting around talking about it, everybody agreed, didn't matter if they were from the most, um, you know, green environmental group to the mo most business focused logging uh, contractor or something like that, they all agreed, we don't want these forests to burn. And so they, they found that, that area where they all agreed and they all said, okay, well, what can we do to solve this problem? And they came up with this collaborative process and they started to work it through. And as a result, they've actually been able to do 10 years worth of work in some of those forests and are now doing a second called an environmental impact statement where they're actually able to do even more area over an even longer period of time. And so, these are the processes that need to be updated. We need to stop the necessarily combative, I disagree with you, so there ought to be a law mindset and come up with other ways to handle these problems. Thank you, Jason. Uh, appreciate your, um, your thoroughness in that, in that answer. Um, we're gonna start to turn over to the questions we have in the Q&A, and I actually wanna get to the last question first because I think it's a good time to recap for those that maybe don't have access or can't read the seven principles right now, Jason, if you could run through quickly the seven principles and what they are and just give us a quick one-liner on each principle. Yeah, and what I'll do is uh, I'll just um, share on the screen because there are a few okay. people who are asking. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen and let people actually see um, right. the the seven principles. Now, you can see them, hopefully. Um, so the first principle is that environmental stewardship starts with individuals, not politicians or bureaucracies, and that one we've already discussed. Property rights are the most basic of human rights, and they're an essential foundation for environmental stewardship. Third version of that is, if you own something, you tend to take care of it. The third one, competition and voluntary cooperation fosters innovation, and the wise use of nat natural resources. And on that one, again, the, the example that I use when I'm speaking about these is that sense uh, application, that voluntary uh, action on the part of a company came up with this, not some mandate, mandate 
uh, from from uh, from a government agency. So um, the fourth one, efficiency is key to reducing environmental impacts. And the best way that I have found to describe that is in the switch from um, <clears throat> from uh, incandescent light bulbs to LED light bulbs. In between, there was a step that involved CFL bulbs, the compact fluorescence. And uh, what we found was that those CFLs were actually mandated by the federal government and it became illegal to produce new incandescent bulbs. And there was a big pushback against the CFLs. Um, and the LEDs uh, actually had been a much more market oriented um, force and trying to uh, make that work. Uh, number five, harming prosperity harms the environment. We already talked about how people who are living hand to mouth in developing nations tend to be, um, they don't have that same incentive to uh, think long term. They're just trying to survive today. Uh, number six is top down approaches rarely work. Uh, basically, getting an order or a diktat from on high is not going to be as effective as uh, like talking to your neighbor and learning something new, uh, discussing a possibility with um, somebody on uh, social media or something like that. And then the last one is the one that we just discussed, that technological innovation is key to improving uh, the environment. And um, so those are the, the seven principles. And again, those are all available um, to be, I apologize, uh, I just noticed that I was not sharing the screen, um, but um, there they are again, uh, through one, one through seven. Uh, and again, people are able to download this from the Mackinac Center's website. If you go to Mackinac.org and then look for environment, Click on the environment link, and then you can, it'll take you right to a spot where you can um, where you can download that entire report. And so um, I'll let Todd kick in here as well, so he can can have a say. Uh, and I'll leave that up for a little bit longer since I was not sharing the screen when I was uh, going through those. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Todd. Did you want to comment on those seven, seven principles? Any, any particular principle that you wanted to highlight before we get into the, the questions, the Q and A from the audience? I just want to add that uh, free market environmentalism is not new. People have talked about it for a long time. Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize um, in economics, talked about how small collaborative groups of people could solve environmental problems and, and uh, resource problems better than top-down approaches. Problem has been that it's difficult to, to coordinate groups of people in a voluntary way. That sometimes if, if the problem affects a large enough number of people, what you do is you essentially deputize government to act on behalf of all of them. But with technology, we're now able to expand the number of people who can coordinate um, and how we can make decisions. So, the opportunities to engage people directly rather than outsourcing to government is expanding. So um, these principles, I think, you know, 50 years ago when we created the EPA, um, they were useful in a limited way, but now they are useful in a very expansive way. There's lots of opportunities where you can apply these where we simply couldn't um, before. Yesterday was the 13th anniversary of the um, creation of the iPhone. You know, when it was created, people thought this was cool, and but, but you know, didn't know what to do with it. 13 years later, all people talk about is you need to get off your dang phone. Uh, so it shows how rapidly technology is improving and can change things. I think these principles are where we should look in the future. Um, and the critique is, is it well, but they wouldn't have solved the problems in the past. That may be true, but technology is allowing us to apply them in new ways for the future. Thank you, Todd. I'm going to turn to the uh, questions from the audience. First one from Sydney Hansen. And Todd, we'll start with you on this question. Sustainability is a leading environmental buzzword, buzzword prone by many world leaders. Um, we hear it quite often, um, especially coming from the continent of Europe. What is this concept for environmental policy? 
question is, how do you want to take the word sustainability? Is it just a political buzzword, which I think it is for most folks, that is just a surrogate for the word environmentally friendly? In that case, I use it from time to time. I don't have a big problem with using it in that way, but I think you just have to recognize that that's what it is. The argument though, if you take it more seriously, more literally and say that something has to be sustainable over the long run, that's where I think the word becomes extremely problematic. So for instance, if I said in 1970, um, by the year 2020, everybody is gonna be taking photos, everybody's gonna have a camera in their pocket, they are gonna be taking multiple photos a day and they're gonna be sharing those photos with hundreds and sometimes thousands of people on a daily basis. You would have said, oh, I'm, I'm gonna buy silver because think of all the film and all the prints and everything that we're gonna use silver for. We're going to, if we don't get a lot of silver, it's gonna be really expensive and the value of silver will go up. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We don't use silver anymore to do photos. So what, looked, what would have looked in 1970 to be totally unsustainable is actually very sustainable today because we have the technology has changed. So predicting sustainability, right, activities that can be sustained over the long run today is virtually impossible because prices change, the technology change, how we use things change. And so that's why I think sustainability when it's used as sort of a political buzzword, I think it can be annoying sometimes because I think it gets overused, but it doesn't bother me too much because it's just it's just the notion that we want to be environmentally friendly, which I agree with. If, however, you try to apply it in a more rigorous way, I think it, it falls apart completely. Thanks, Todd. Jason, uh, same question to you on the topic of sustainability and its use, use as a buzzword and, and what it really means to you. Right. A lot of the time when I'm dealing with difficult questions, one of the things that I try to do is go back to foundations. And so I think back to the deep, dark past when I was in uh, doing my undergrad and uh, we had um, like sustainability defined by the UN and the, the Brundtland campaign. And back then, back in the 90s, uh, sustainability was a, a th they often referred to it as a three-legged stool that when to be sustainable there's environmental issues associated with it obviously but there's also economic and social issues that have to be dealt with and so the old saying was that if you are sitting on a three-legged stool and somebody cuts one leg off the stool what happens Tool falls over, right? So sustainability, qua sustainability, doesn't actually work unless you deal with all of those three aspects, which is one of the reasons why Todd is right in saying that it's become a, a buzzword and it falls apart when you actually start to look at what is classified as sustainable today. Because a lot of the time, sustainable today doesn't deal with either economic or social issues. It just focuses on uh, environmental. And so if you recognize that coming in and saying, okay, well, this community, um, you guys cannot log this area anymore. You may have been doing it for decades and, and that sort of thing, but whatever. We don't think that's sustainable. Okay, well, now you've gotten rid of the social and the economic aspect because the people that worked providing logs to an area or, uh, you know, running the equipment, all that sort of thing. Now they're all out of work. And in the social, the money that they made, the taxes they paid, all those sorts of things went into supporting infrastructures, you know, paying for schools, doing all those sorts of things. So now suddenly all of that's gone. And um, if you've ever lived in a small town that it, uh, relied on a mill or something like that, uh, and that mill is closed because of government mandates or any of those sorts of things, you learn about sustainability really quickly because economics and social factors really do play a, a role. So, uh, again, it's become a buzzword, and it's really falling apart because people don't pay attention to actual original definitions that meant something and actually played a role in what sustainability was supposed to be. Let me just add Thank something you. Uh, ahead, to Todd. what you said. Sure. Yeah, it's fantastic because the issue of economics and social, um, in addition to environmental, 
Um, I'll give you an example. In Nicaragua, there's a group called Paso Pacifico that is working to stop poaching of sea turtle eggs because sea turtles are endangered and poaching of their eggs so that people can sell them um, is one of the biggest threats to them. But what Paso Pacifico did is, is that they recognized the right of people to take those eggs as they had been for hundreds of years. So rather than just saying, I'm sorry, you need to sacrifice to help the planet or the sea turtles, they recognized that social right that they had and they recognized the economic desperation that was there. So what they did was they worked with the poachers and now they do a variety of things, but one of the most interesting things was that the poachers will come to them and say, look, I have these eggs. Here are the eggs from the leatherback turtle, which is endangered. You can have them and incubate them. I'm gonna keep these eggs from a turtle that is not endangered because I need to make money. And that, it, you know, recognizing that social right, recognize the economics is what led them to come up with something that is gonna help the turtle, the, the endangered turtle. Thank you for that, uh, that story, Todd. Thanks for that explanation. Um, really great uh, comments and really enjoying this discussion. Um, we've got a couple more questions and time to get to all of them, I believe. Next question is from Dr. Zako, um, and um, I'll, I'll just leave this, whomever wants to take this question. What is the current status of Pipeline 5? I believe that has a direct impact on, on the state of Michigan. Um, so I don't know if, Jason, you want to take that one on, on the current status of Pipeline 5. Yeah, Line 5 is the pipeline that runs between the UP and the Lower Peninsula through the Straits of Mackinac. The current status of it right now is that it has, by uh, by court order, been shut down uh, because there was a, a support that was holding up the pipeline that had shifted uh, recently. They're not 100% sure what caused the shift. There's some guess that it might have been strong currents at the bottom of the lake, but they don't know for sure. So it's just, it's you know, educated guesses right now. But um, because of that, uh, there was a recent circuit court uh, order in Michigan that mandated that uh, Enbridge, the company that owns and operates that pipeline, that they close both legs of, of the pipeline. So it's currently not shipping any uh, oil or natural gas liquids, crude oil or natural gas liquids. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Final question, and I'll open this up to both Jason and Todd. Uh, Todd, let's start with you first. Which principle or principles address the market failures of pollution as a negative externality from various economic activities? And this is from Ed, Ed Rivet, I believe it is, in our audience. So I think um, seven, I don't have them in front of me, but I think several of them, I think there's no question that, as I said before, if pollution is free, then there's no incentive um, for you to stop doing it. Um, but what we need to do is to empower people to be able to um, negotiate and to deal with those um, types of pollution, to recognize those costs. So Ronald Coase, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, recognized that you could have these um, externalities, but that through mutual negotiation that you could solve them more effectively than having government do it top down. Because government may not come up with the right um, cost assessment of what that pollution costs. They may under um, price it or over price it. But if you can get people together who are in, who are impacted by it, then you can come up with a mutually agreeable price. So if I want to put, you know, um, something in the water, some a little bit of uh, pollution, and the fishermen downstream say, "Hey, you're killing all the fish," the guy says, "Okay, well, you can either pay me not to do it, or I can pay you so that I can do it." You're going to come up with a solution that is much more likely to reflect the real price of that pollution. Um, rather than government coming in and either favoring the polluter or favoring the fishermen and just telling the other side, sorry, sucks to be you. So that's a better approach. So I think that it is in your, the, the costs are inherent in all of these things, no doubt about that. The question, the key question is, how do you resolve those costs in a way that is best for the environment? Thank you, Todd. Uh, Jason, we'll wrap up with you quickly, uh, less than one minute, if you can, on um, addressing the negative externalities of uh, pollution. 
um, from various economic activities. Right, and I put the, the list back up so uh, Thank you. people could see it. Short version, uh, Coase was talking about really number two, uh, where he was saying property rights are the most basic of human rights, because he was saying if you have a property right, uh, and then you can manage transaction costs. So that's the short answer, again, because I've only got one minute. But um, those are the, the ways that, that these issues can be handled. Uh, there is also a bunch of work that has been done by people like Sean Reagan at PERC. If you go to perk.org and, and search for uh, Regan, R-E-G-A-N, and Coase, you'll probably find this, his articles on this. But um, yeah, essentially, if you have a property right, you are going to work to maintain it and protect it. And that's, that's what Coase was talking about, that you don't, um, you don't, you cannot claim a right to infringe on a right. So I can't just say, well, I've got a right to produce pollution. Um, and that just is a blanket approval method of allowing me to dump whatever I want into the water or the air because that influences or infringes on other people's rights. So if you're going to be watching and watching out for and protecting rights, then you have to recognize that responsibilities go with rights. And again, read Coast because that's exactly what he was talking about. Great, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jason and Todd, for great discussion here. And thank you to the audience for sticking with us and asking some, some uh, really interesting questions. Um, before we wrap up, Todd, where can we find your work if we want to learn more about uh, what you're doing out in Washington? So our webpage is uh, WashingtonPolicy.org. Um, I write obviously a lot about Washington State issues, but um, the crazy idea is that in Washington State often have a way of migrating around the country, so you can see them here first. Follow me on Twitter at WA Policy Green. Well, let's keep the Chaz or the Chop, or whatever it's called today, over there in Washington. Okay, let's let, not, let export that around the country. <laughs> And Jason, um, any final uh, thoughts from you as to where we can find your work and any future work that the Mackinac, Mackinac Center is doing on environmental policy? Yeah, so I did uh, already say go to Mackinac.org, and it's M-A-C-K-I-N-A-C dot O-R-G. Uh, click on the environment link, and you'll be able to see the, the op-eds, blog posts, uh, reports, and that that we are writing. And it's been a busy past few months while we've been locked up dealing with uh, COVID uh, lockdowns, uh, lockdowns being locked away. Uh, I've written a lot of stuff, so watch for uh, several reports coming out here in the next month to two months. Lots to see, lots to read about. Great, Jason, thank you so much. For all those that joined us, um, you um, have been, Many of you that are on this call are, are longtime supporters of the Mackinac Center, so we encourage you to continue to do so, continue to support the Mackinac Center and our work on environmental policy, on all of the other work that Joe Lehman mentioned at the start of this uh, event, on education, on labor, regulatory, on responding to government overreach. Um, none of it would be possible without our supporters, so we ask you if you can um, to continue to support and increase support, both from a monthly perspective or annual perspective and contact either myself or Jim Walker or anyone on our advancement team about how you could go about doing that. Um, and if you want to share this event and all of our events that we've hosted uh, via this series, you can find them via our YouTube channel. Just type in Mackinac Center on YouTube and you'll find us there or go to our webpage mackinac.org backslash events and you'll find links to these events. This one should be up within the next 24 hours or so. Um, in the interim, we wish you and all of your family and friends a safe and uh, enjoyable Independence Day weekend. Thank you. Take care, everyone.